Hello and welcome to Poinsettia Production, Back to Basics from the Eki Ranch. Uh, my name is Rebecca Simmonsma. I'm the Technical Services Manager for the ranch and I'll be presenting to you today along with my colleague Roger Kehoe. Roger, do you want to take a minute to say hi? Hello everyone and welcome to our uh, program on Poinsettia Propagation today. Our first in a series of three presentations we'll be doing this summer. Uh, the second will be in late July and we'll cover uh, pinch, transplant, and flower initiation, and we'll follow up in September on finishing. Okay, thank you, Roger. Um, as Roger did mention, this is our first session in a three-part series, Back to Basics. You will receive uh, email invitations for those sessions. Um, after this session, you'll receive one for the one in July, and then following that session, we'll, we'll send out emails for the session in August. Um, we decided to do this series this summer um, back to basics just because we felt like it, there's a need sometimes to just kind of get back to basic, you know, the basics and refresh yourself about what those plants actually need. Um, you know, sometimes we get into a lot of different technology and chemicals and things like that and, you know, take it farther than we need to sometimes. And so we think back to basics is important uh, to just look back at all the fundamental things that we've learned about poinsettias. And with this session, we'll start with propagation. On today's session, we do have a number of people participating, and so you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. Uh, but we do still want you to feel like you can ask as many questions um, that you need to. There is a question and answer toolbar to the right of your screen, and so if you want to just go ahead and type your question in, the, in that toolbar, we will stop periodically to address those questions. Uh, we're on the call for an hour today, and so we will address as many questions as time allows. Uh, should we have un unanswered questions, uh, we do have your email address, and so we'll address those questions via email after the session. Today's session is being recorded, uh, so don't feel like you have to scramble to take notes because you can go back and view the session at www.eki.com on, on media. It's our newest uh, tool that we have to offer. If you go to eki.com, in the very top um, center of your screen, you'll see a link to on media, and you can just go ahead and follow that, and you'll be able to view this session as well as previously recorded webinars that we have housed there. Um, this session will be available to review in about 24 hours. Okay, with that I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Roger. Okay, well let's get started here. Uh, the cutting start in our farms in Guatemala, we have over 65 acres of production. Uh, highlight, lots of energy come in on the cuttings, and in the next slide you'll see uh, some of our stock beds uh, in Guatemala. Uh, we have mature stock plants that uh, do not flush cuttings out of various sizes. We get a very uniform size off of a mature stock base. And the cuttings uh, are produced uh, and harvested on a regular basis. And so we're able to, as you can see on this next slide, now produce three different cutting sizes. Um, we have our one and a half inch Euro, our two inch standard, which is our most uh, commonly used size, and the three inch direct stick. Uh, these cuttings all have uh, similar maturities. They will uh, root uh, and respond in a similar fashion, but as you can see uh, as we go to our next slide, we have uh, three distinct lengths uh, of the product. Uh, you can see the three inch, the two inch, and on the right the one and a half inch. And note the uh, caliper of the cutting and the maturity level is there. Uh, direct stick, or just as the name implies, uh, used for uh, often uh, the six inch and above uh, direct stick programs. Uh, it's a larger cutting, tends not to get lost in the media. It can be stuck very quickly on fast moving lines. The two inch standard is the one that most of you are familiar with. That's used in direct stick programs, and it's also used in some liner production, uh, as well as some four inch and smaller sizes. But the uh, Euro cutting is used uh, Interestingly, also by some growers in direct stick, uh, certainly it's good in four inch, but we see it used also in uh, six and eight inch pots uh, as well. But uh, you've got choices here uh, on these cuttings. I think most of you are aware of the different sizes we have available, and it's just important to note that um, they are not uh, mature versus immature cuttings. Uh, it's just a matter of stock management to produce the different sizes uh, with uniform caliper and rooting response uh, that you see here. Okay, 
Uh, just want to cover uh, these lists. I find it useful to talk about uh, uh, reasons that uh, things don't work too well and some of the basic problems. One of them here is that the propagation just plain goes poorly. Um, the uh, cuttings aren't rooted on time, uh, root response is uneven, and so forth. And the number one item would be too bright. Uh, we recommend uh, 1,200 to 1,500 foot candles. And there's plenty of light in the summer. You'll get plenty of moles of light on your crop. There's no reason to try to put too much sun to the cuttings. Certainly, summer propagation is vastly different than your winter propagation. There's plenty of moles of light in a longer day, 14, 15 hours uh, easily. And uh, you've got plenty of light energy available. And when it's too bright, uh, you often are too wet. And with too wet, uh, you end up with uh, leaching and disease and some other uh, slow rooting. Uh, maybe the media gets saturated with too much water and you don't get good callus formation. Uh, another problem can be too little humidity. You know, understand uh, that the greenhouse warms up, and as it warms, the air mass uh, won't hold as much moisture, so it's important not to ventilate too much and try to hold the humidity in and around the cuttings to uh, maintain turgor until those roots are formed. Uh, too fast environmental change. Uh, you, you have to gradually change the greenhouse environment and uh, not work by a calendar and say, okay, well, today's day number 10. I'm going to increase air ventilation or something. You need to gradually make those changes based on weather conditions and how the cuttings are looking. And then still uh, not too common, but we do see poor sanitation still uh, get into play uh, for disease and fungus nap management. Rebecca will talk about that a little bit later. In the next slide, we have uh, reasons for slow and uneven rooting. So maybe sometimes you see that some of your cuttings are rooting much faster than others. And here's some common reasons uh, why. Believe it or not, it can be too cold. A good rooting temperature for poinsettia is 72 degrees for the media. And uh, you get some of those cool nights, especially up in the north. And uh, you can be chilling those cuttings down. That media could drop down into the low 60s. So uh, that certainly is, uh, can be a factor, especially if you have a lot of shade on. Uh, and uh, possibly the too wet condition can give you a cooler temperature as you've got excess moisture and the colder water and the evaporation is uh, chilling the cuttings down. So um, also we can see too much growth regulator can impair the rooting. We have some slides of that we'll show you later. And then on the opposite end, uh, just going too bright can stress the cuttings. They wilt excessively. They don't get up into photosynthesis, and uh, the plant uh, depletes its carbohydrates. You don't get the root development and callus properly, and uh, some cuttings uh, are stressed and uh, may take weeks to root. And in the next slide, uh, we do see sometimes uneven growth. So if you walk into the propagation and you look and you see some cuttings have jumped up higher than others, and you're seeing uneven growth uh, a little bit later on, uh, it means that your responses aren't uniform across the population in the greenhouse. So this could be caused by not grading a plant uh, as you receive cuttings. Sometimes you may see uh, some in there. Certainly if you pull the, the smaller cuttings out and put them together, it makes it a little bit easier to take care of those downstream. Uh, late PGR applications uh, can cause that where you're not getting in in the first seven days and applying the PGR uh, in propagation. We'll talk in detail about that later but that has a, a huge uh, effect on the uniformity of the crop. Uneven temperatures uh, and light, anything that causes the uh, gradient and different uh, responses in the cutting population can cause this unevenness. Uneven rooting, which is probably uh, you know, one of the top reasons, uh, is that some of the cuttings are rooting behind others because of the stress factors. And the ones that are first to root start to grow faster and then the ones that uh, are slower to root uh, are behind. And then you get longer cuttings to, uh, with shorter cuttings. And certainly, when you're planting direct stick into 8-inch pots, you've got multiple cuttings. Uh, if you uh, are you know, growing large numbers, you need to uh, grade a plant. Uh, any unevenness that you have makes it very difficult to manage uh, the, the transplant process and maintain uniformity through the end of the crop. And uh, we'll show you some slides on uh, keeping those tips uncovered and the impact that that can have on the uh, rooting as well. Okay.
And do we have any questions, Rebecca? Uh, we do. We have a question here about our stock plant management, and they're wondering, um, you know, if we they could we could give them some kind of idea of growth regulating treatments that you know would be applied to that stock and how the stock is treated before they receive that cutting. Wow, uh, there's no hard and fast program that just works everywhere. Uh, understand that we have uh, participants today from from Canada all the way down to uh, South Florida. So uh, that's difficult to do, but commonly used uh, would be uh, bonsai um, and uh, uh, maybe psychocell can be used um, and uh, some uh, B9. So um, those rates and so forth would vary would depend on uh, where the grower is. So I would suggest actually uh, writing into us or going to the bulletin board, Rebecca, and uh, uh, posting a question there. Okay. Um, it looks like we've answered all the questions uh, that we have so far. I do have a couple questions that have come in about zero tall and uncovering the tips and things. Um, we are going to go into detail about each aspect of culture you know, as we get through the presentation. So we'll go back to those questions when we get to that point. Okay, with that, I'm going to talk about preparing for the cuttings and the steps that you can take before the cuttings come and as the cuttings are arriving and you're sticking to ensure that you have successful propagation. Sanitation is one of the first things, as Roger mentioned, that you need to think about uh, prior to when the cut, you know, before the cuttings come. And while the cuttings are in your greenhouse, as you mentioned, it is something that we do see less commonly um, as a reason for poor propagation and unsuccessful propagation, but it is still something to think about and not to overlook. Uh, one of the first things that you want to do is make sure that that greenhouse is power washed and disinfected. And there are various products that you can use. Um, some of them that we suggest would be Green Shield, Chlorine, Nacosan, or Fysan. Um, some growers do use, th the chlorine bleach is one of the things that we would stress, uh, that you just need to make sure that everything is rinsed properly after you've used that. Bleach toxic toxicity is something that you can see on poinsettia cutting. So if you're going to be doing your disinfecting, um, with these products, and particularly the chlorine, just make sure that you're rinsing well um, after you've used that uh, disinfectant. And you do want to pay special attention to pipes and drains. Um, you know, you can get water sitting in those drains and algae growth, and it can be just, you know, like a whole whole hotel of fungus gnats if you're not careful. And so pay close attention to those areas. You know, you obviously want to make sure that the greenhouse is weed-free um, and algae-free. Those are all going to be situations that would harbor disease and fungus gnats. And when it comes to actually sticking the cuttings, obviously you want to start with clean hands and tools, etc. Make sure the work area is clean. Keep antibacterial soap in the work area and encourage your workers to use it often, frequently and often. And as those cuttings are coming in and you're sticking, you know, train your workers to inspect for any yellow leaves or damaged leaves that might be present at the time that you're sticking and have those leaves removed before you stick. Um, it's kind of a labor saving um, tip as well because it's you know it's easier to remove at that point than to go back in and remove those leaves as you know once the cuttings are in the greenhouse and any yellow leaves like that can lead to kind of an abscission situation and if you have that you know leaf dead decaying leaf there in the propagation area it's only going to harbor um, you know start issues with botrytis. Liming the floors is something that you know we've done at the ranch for many many years, but we are seeing more growers uh, use lime, and the you know the use is increasing. Lime on the floors prevents algae growth and problems with fungus gnats, so it's actually you know a real cost-effective alternative to disinfection and a preventative continued preventative measure for those for the algae and the fungus gnats. I did want to point out that we also have a new tool uh, available at ecchi.com called on, on Time, and it's a freight logistics web tracking system. Um, this is a really great tool for you to use, particularly if you're receiving large amounts of cuttings each week and you're trying to plan, you know, for when those cuttings are going to arrive, how much labor you need for sticking those cuttings, etc. You can use the program two different ways. Um, if you have your ECI order number or your broker PO number, you can go on to on time. You don't have to create an account to use the system. You just have to have one of those two numbers. And the week that the shipment is actually coming, um, say Monday morning or sometimes Sunday night, depending on if it's, you know, what week it is and when we're packing, once that those cuttings have been taken and actually processed in Guatemala, you'll be able to see a box count, you know, and if it's 1 through 30, you'll be able to see what's in, you know, what cuttings are in each box. And this is a really great tool if you've got 
multiple propagation greenhouses and you need to know, you know, which cuttings are going to which greenhouses, you can actually plan and have that ready to go so that when the boxes come, you're not opening up each box and looking to find the cuttings because, you know, that that's going to shorten the amount of time that those cuttings are, um, you know, before you can get those cuttings stuck. And so it's a good planning tool. And then once the cuttings have actually shipped, you'll be able to track that shipment in process, whether it's FedEx or UPS or truck. Um, first, it'll take you to our ECI site so that you can see all of the processes that that cutting went to prior to the actual shipping environment. And then it will take you to the carrier's website where you can actually track the, the shipment in process. So this allows you to know, you know, to the hour what time those cuttings are going to be arriving so you can prepare accordingly. And again, that's available at ecchi.com in the same place that you'd find on media. Handling cuttings upon arrival is, you know, a very important kind of the first step that you're going to take to ensure that those you're going to have su successful propagation. You know, you want to do it in a timely manner. Um, this is an example of what the boxes would look like when the cuttings arrive. We do have a new boxing system this year, uh, so it'll look a little bit different than this. But, um, you know, this is an example of what, what you can expect to see. We do want you to take note that on every box that comes in and every bag of cuttings that come, comes in, uh, there is a corresponding label with that bag, and there will also be a little piece of paper with a number on it. And that's really important for a number of different reasons. And so, you know, as those cuttings are being processed, you also want to be collecting those labels and make sure that they stay with those corresponding cuttings. And this is a picture of the little number that you would see, and sometimes it's just inside the bag laying on top of the cuttings. You know, what these labels actually are is, you know, the label gives real specific information like cut date, greenhouse location, stock location, but this little number that's in the bag is actually the cutter number. And so if you have an issue with your cuttings and you call tech support at Ecky Ranch or you call customer service, one of the very first things that we will ask is, you know, did you save the labels and do you have that cutter number? Because that allows us to go back and look at the entire process that those under the cuttings went through to reach your door and then we can try to decide, you know, what happened in that process. Is it a stock plant management process? Uh, do we need to retrain our cutter? Is there something going on with the cutting? Is there something going on with how the cuttings were processed? You know, shipping environment. It just gives us the entire history of that cutting, and we can go back and take a look. So I definitely want to stress that it's really important to save those labels and that cutter number. And this is just another example here. This is a close-up of what the label would look like and that cutter number. So we want to talk about handling practices and how you should actually be treating those cuttings when they come in. Um, you want to un open those boxes immediately upon arrival. Even if you have to hold them overnight in a cooler situation, we still would like to see you open those boxes. And it is important to record the temperature if you have, you know, the tools to do it. The temperature of that box will tell, you know, a lot about the story of that cutting if we run into issues later with leaf yellowing or things like that. And, you know, so initial temperatures in the box are important. Um, you want to remove the bags and place them on racks in the cooler. And we'd like to see that cooler held at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It is tempting to go colder. You know, the thought process, the colder, you know, the, the cooler is will help restore turgidity of the cuttings. But we have found that, you know, cooler than 50 degrees, and you can see some chilling injury to those cuttings. So 50 degrees is perfect. We do like to see the humidity high. Um, you know, some customers are set up with an actual misting system in their cooler, which is ideal. Um, you know, others may have to go in and mist on an hourly basis to keep those cuttings turgid. But if you can restore the turgid, turgidity of that cutting before you actually stick it in the greenhouse environment, it's going to result in a lot less stress in the greenhouse environment. So how you handle these cuttings even prior to stick goes a long way in how that cutting is going to perform. Um, you want to make sure when you're sticking that you're not removing any more cuttings from the cooler or from the boxes than you can stick in one hour. We don't want those cuttings sitting out, you know, in the greenhouse environment or, the, you know, wherever you're sticking um, because it's just going to be, you know, a situation where that cutting can desiccate even further. You want to plant your sensitive varieties first. Um, in general, we would say that the light leaf cultivars and the novelties tend to be more sensitive to things like heat stress. Um, you know, or prolonged time in shipping. And so you'd want to look at your, you know, your Peter Stars and during um, some of those and then your novelty varieties like Winter Rose and things that need to be stuck right away. You know, and so that goes back to the on, uh, the on track program. You'll know what's in each box and you can go back and look and know that in box five, six, and seven, those are my novelty varieties and I need to address those first. And again, we want to see all the cuttings stuck within 24 hours. Okay, we've got some time to open it up for questions. I do have uh, quite a few questions that have come in here. Um, I do have a question about lime on the floor. 
and if we could kind of give an idea of how, how heavy you put the lime on the floor and what the procedure for that would be. Okay, well, we've been doing that for, for a long time at the ranch by uh, mixing it in a slurry uh, and using a slurry pump to pump it onto the floor. Um, there's a lot of different pumps available. It's important to keep the material mixed and uh, spray it uh, fairly uniformly and pretty heavily just to uh, basically paint the floor. Um, I don't have any rate information on that uh, before me right now, but uh, that could be provided. And uh, again, the, the key there is just the control of uh, fungus gnats and uh, the ability to uh, sanitize uh, even a, a dirt floor. Uh, for those of you with concrete floors and benches, certainly uh, remove the debris left over from spring production, all the organic material, and uh, it's good to power wash, get the algae, and uh, get that concrete in those areas clean. And any trays that you use, uh, make sure, of course, that they're disinfected as well. So that uh, initial sanitation and cleanup is uh, definitely critical, and uh, it's good to, to be on that uh, well before the cuttings arrive. Okay, and we do, I do want to point out we have a number of questions here about the type of lime that we use and the actual rate and processes that are used. Um, I can get that specific information for everyone that's asked because, we, you know, we have, as Roger said, we have been doing it for a number of years at the ranch, and, um, you know, so we can get that information. There's also a question here about how often do we apply the lime, and I believe at the ranch we, we only apply at the start of the crop. Is that correct, Roger? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Uh, let's see, I have another question here about the bleach ratio and, you know, what our dilution ratio and recommended ratio for the bleach is, and I can get that information as well, especially with the bleach, we want to be pretty careful about that because it can have some residual effects, and you can see some toxicity, and so rather than, you know, give you what a rate off the top of my head, I'd rather give a real specific rate and make sure that we're correct on that. Oh, and I see we have John Paul Williams on the call with us today. Um, he is actually our off-site propagation manager, and he does have a ratio for the lime uh, for us. He, he says here that we use 50 gallons of water and three bags, three 50-pound bags of lime to create the slurry. Um, he doesn't say what type of specific lime here, but we can get that information. So again, that's 50 gallons of water and three pound bags, uh, three 50-pound bags of lime to make the slurry. Thanks for that, JP. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Roger, and now we're going to talk about the actual process of sticking the cuttings. Okay, uh, let's go right to the first slide uh, on moving hormone. Uh, we use very little uh, growth regulators in the stock, and we do take uniform, mature cuttings. So the cuttings are fairly neutral in their response and should root well. Uh, certainly, poinsettias are not difficult to root. The reason for using a rooting hormone would be that within any group of cuttings that you have, and you're planting typically thousands, um, you will have some that uh, will root a little bit slower than others for whatever the reason um, as the cuttings are, are harvested uh, off the stock plants and shipped. So we do suggest using a rooting hormone. Uh, we have uh, one of the commercially available uh, chemicals there uh, listed uh, and some rates. Uh, you can go up to about 1,500 parts per million with IBA, uh, without the NAA, uh, and certainly uh, start on some of the lower rates and, and work your way up. An indication that your concentration is too high could be anywhere from burn at the base of the cutting to maybe just getting like goosebumps uh, coming out up the stem as, and some twisting of the foliage and petioles as the hormone uh, impacts the uh, uh, the upper parts of the cutting. Uh, we recommend a quick dip, not soaking the cuttings, just dip them in and plant. Um, some growers like to spray overhead. You can run into some phyto problems with those sprays. Uh, we don't do that. I uh, really wouldn't recommend it, but uh, certainly it's quicker and there are some growers that are, are successful with it. But with so many varieties that we offer, some are sensitive to that application method. And uh, exposing leaves and petioles to rooting hormone will, will cause the twisting. So if you spill any or, uh, again, if you're dipping too deep, all you need to do is dip that bottom uh, quarter, half inch of the cutting uh, into the solution and plant it, and you'll be fine. Okay? Uh, here's just to illustrate uh, a poor planting job. It's very important for uniform rooting to not cover those uh, actively growing tips. 
Here you can see some big leaves are covering uh, maybe about half the cuttings in that strip. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see a good planting job. Uh, if you hold a poinsettia cutting and just look down on it, you'll see that the big leaves come out uh, opposite each other off the stem. And so it's good to put those big leaves towards the outside. Um, and that way you're directing them so that they don't cast shade on, on the tips. In the next slide, you can see an example of good and bad planting job. On the left, um, the sticker has really just jammed that cutting down in there pretty far. Uh, the petioles buried in the uh, oasis and may rot. And uh, there's a good chance of some physical damage. Uh, usually you have to hold the cutting pretty hard. You might squeeze it. And in squeezing the stem, you could uh, invite uh, infection from uh, Erwinia or, or Botrytis. And there on the right, you can see a good sticking job uh, with the cutting just about halfway down into the media. So whether it's a preformed media or a, a loose fill, um, the principles are certainly the same. Uh, no point in planting the cutting too deeply. And uh, you don't want to get down into the bottom, especially in liner production of the, of the media, because there's a lot more moisture down there, and you won't get good callus. And the next slide, you can see some of the effects. Uh, it's quite easy to see uh, if a planter has aggressively stuck the cutting. Um, and oftentimes, uh, someone who's that rough with it is, is also damaging the stem somewhat. So uh, again, open to a winning infection. Um, it's a good idea maybe to have uh, some of your planters uh, put their label in there so that you can uh, trace back and find out uh, maybe you have a few workers that uh, haven't planted poinsettia cuttings before that are uh, damaging them. Uh, direct stick, um, well, here we have uh, a poor job in the photo. Uh, you want to moisten the medium to a, me uh, to a medium level, uh, not saturate the soil and waterlog it but uh, you don't want to plant just into dry soil. Uh, get some moisture on there uh, right away. If you have bark or chunk or uh, a dense media, uh, you can dibble a hole first. We recommend that and just lay the cutting into the hole. Uh, with loose media, you don't need to dibble a hole, but certainly don't pack the soil by heavy irrigation after sticking. Um, so we do not recommend uh, watering in uh, certainly heavily and closing the hole or uh, uh, sealing that up. And the reason is that you will get better callus on a poinsettia cutting if it gets more oxygen at the base of the cutting. So uh, if uh, you actually drop a cutting into the propagation area and it doesn't get planted at all, it'll typically callus. It just won't root. So lots of oxygen is very important at that stage. And then after callus, uh, you can go ahead and water in with a nutrient solution and close that hole up. And we'll talk about uh, nutrition uh, later in the presentation. OK. Misting guidelines, very difficult to recommend uh, to everyone in such a wide geography here to, uh, to have any uh, set rules. Uh, but there are certain principles. Um, have mist ready to go, as Rebecca said. Prepare that mist. Make sure that those nozzles aren't clogged and that they're working well. And then your mist frequency is going to depend on light, temperature, humidity, and air movement uh, in the propagation area. But Theoretically, uh, you want to supply a constant film of moisture to the leaf surface and maintain relative humidity at about 100% without waterlogging the media. So uh, it's a fine balance. Certainly, the, the demand for mist is greater during the uh, middle of the day. And uh, one indication on stuck cuttings is uh, within a couple days, you really should have the cuttings standing out flat in the bed. If they continue to roll, and typically the outside of the leaf will curl upward, uh, that's a sign that you're too dry. And it could be your humidity is too low, or you need to mist more, or maybe a combination of the two. So when you see the leaf rolling and you see that, uh, that curling, uh, that's definitely an indication that you're too dry. OK. And here's some sample schedules, uh, recommendations, uh, which include maybe some night mist. Uh, You've, you've got to watch if you're running heat or you've got any air movement during the night. Uh, it just takes some trial and error maybe to find the right rate, but it doesn't hurt to make sure the cuttings don't dry out uh, during the night. And then after about a week, you can stop the night mist. And again, that will depend on whether you're north or south and just what your conditions are and the kind of uh, heat and light that you're dealing with, uh, especially during the day. Okay. 
Here uh, we've got a sample uh, uh, on the left of a normal uh, oasis cutting. On the right, completely different root structure, and that's uh, basically from being at saturation all the time. So uh, there's no reason to keep your media saturated. If you don't get good root branching and some root hairs developing, and you get those spaghetti-type roots, uh, that's usually a good indication that uh, you're, you're too wet. Uh, less of a problem in some of the preformed media, but certainly in a soil-based media, uh, you don't want to get waterlogged because uh, the root structure uh, will definitely suffer uh, if you're too wet. Uh, also, a wet media, as I said before, has less oxygen in it, and you can uh, get less callus and a poor callus formation. Okay. And just some more misting tips: uh, water quality. Uh, certainly that can play a factor if you're uh, pumping from a reservoir or you have uh, uh, some of the western water sources with lots of salts. Uh, have to be uh, aware of the quality of the water that you're applying. Don't really recommend using fertilizer in the mist. There's a lot of problems you can get into, but certainly phosphoric acid does provide phosphorus, but uh, phosphorus can uh, distort the leaves and produce uh, some phytotoxic effects in the cutting. Um, you can use some xerotol. I know many growers do. Just um, be careful of the rates. Uh, more doesn't necessarily mean that's better. And certainly, uh, you, you've got to be sensitive to interactions with some of the uh, chemicals you may be spraying for disease or insect control. And adjust the misting schedule daily. Uh, it can't just work off the clock. The weather conditions, uh, you know, you've got substantial difference in a July 3rd stick versus an August 3rd stick. So you need to make adjustments uh, and make sure uh, that you're not getting that midday wilting um, after the first few days. So leaf roll, as I said before, will indicate uh, that the misting frequency should increase, or possibly you need to increase shade. Uh, get out there with a light meter and make sure you got the light levels correct. OK. Uh, foliar wetting agents, uh, always an interesting discussion. Uh, many growers uh, swear by using them. Um, we see good results whether they're used or not. Um, you might regain turgor a little bit faster, but I doubt uh, after a couple of weeks you'd see a difference in the cuttings anyway. Uh, maybe useful if you have a large mist droplet size. So if you don't have a good high pressure mist system producing a foggy fine mist, uh, that can help to wet the leaves uh, in those conditions. I would suggest using it sparingly and uh, don't allow it to dry out on the leaves. You can uh, get some desiccation and uh, phytotoxicity possibly. So what you want to do is just start with a low rate that's recommended and see if that breaks the water beads down and increase the rate uh, and concentration until you find that you're, you're getting that sheeting action of the water and the beads are, are, are laying out flat. And you can see here a shot. Um, there's no uh, wetting agent used on these cuttings and the water speed it up, but they're standing up very nicely. So uh, there are cost factors and the potential for interaction with other chemical sprays uh, with uh, the spray adjuvant. So be careful about uh, going with high rates. Uh, we do see FIDO from time to time in some of our customers' greenhouses from that. Okay. And here's a, a shot in uh, one of our greenhouses. And again, um, we don't use it, uh, and these cuttings are standing up fine. This is just a few days after stick. Uh, notice someone did a good job of putting those labels in there, and we can't emphasize that too much. Uh, keep the labels, and it does help us do trace back uh, on the uh, source of the cuttings. And there's one of those numbers in there. And you can see the water droplets uh, and the cutting standing up fine after just a few days. So if the leaves are curling up again, that's an indication you're just getting too dry. OK, any questions? Um, it looks like we have a rooting hormone question here, and you'd mentioned that we could go with 1,500 parts per million IBA and the combination of the NAA, uh, but those rates are different than what we actually recommended for the dip and grow, and they're wondering, you know, the reason for that. Um, we do mix our own rooting hormone at the ranch, and when we mix our own rooting hormone at the ranch, our goal would be to accomplish the 1,500 parts per million uh, IBA and four to 500 parts per million NAA um, but a lot of growers use the, you know, the commercial dip and grow, and there are some other carriers in those um, 
commercial rooting hormones, and it's been our experience with Dip and Grow in particular that if you mix it um, at a higher rate and go up to that 1,500 parts per million of the IBA and the higher rate of the NAA, you can get some burn, and, you know, whether that's from the carrier or the higher parts per million, it's not known, but, you know, just be careful with your rates on, you know, like the Dip and Grow is the one in particular that we've had experience with. If you are mixing your own, again, you could go with the 1,500 parts per million IBA, um, or 2,500 parts per million. I, you could go with 1,500 parts per million IBA and a combination of up to 500 parts per million NAA, or you can go with 2,500 parts per million alone of the IBA. But it is important to note that many growers are successful without a uh, rooting hormone on poinsettias. You know, there are certain varieties that might benefit from it, like your novelties, novelty types and some of the woodier cuttings. Um, you know, but just be careful with those rates and know the product that you're using. Um, and if you have questions, you know, if you have a particular product that you're using that we haven't mentioned today and you need help with dilution ratios um, or things like that, you can always give us a call or post it on the Tech Help Bulletin Board and we'd be happy to help you with that. Um, let's see, I have some questions here about, let's see, about using, um, you know, what would our recommendations be for using fungicide um, you know, fungicide applications in the mist system, if it's applicable. Some, apl some fungicides you can't apply through a mist system, but just wondering what our thoughts are about using a fungicide application right away in the mist. Well, um, I'm not sure exactly how that would work. Most mist systems, uh, I think uh, many of them would clog with fungicide going through, and then how would you apply it? Are you talking about a boom application or a static system overhead? just seems there could be a problem with, uh, you know, maybe over-application or residual left in the mist lines. I tend to think it would just be safer to use a, uh, a spray program uh, application and uh, do that uh, at late in the day or uh, early in the morning uh, to let the application uh, dry somewhat before you have to turn the mist system back on. So um, many growers do like to get in and, and get that application on. Uh, within about three days, once the cuttings are standing up, uh, it's not a bad idea. And um, so I just think that, uh, you know, applying fertilizer, applying other chemicals through the mist is really risky and I think difficult to control in a practical sense in the greenhouse where there's just possibility of cross-contamination with other crops and, and, and into the poinsettia propagation area as well. We just see time and, time and again. Uh, a lot of uh, problems that are, arise from, from that type of an application. Uh, Roger, can you speak a little bit about misting guidelines and how it might differ if you're using a traditional misting system versus booms? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, booms are, are, are good and, and certainly adequate unless the, the run is so long that by the time the boom gets back, the cuttings are dry. And that's an effect that you can get in the first uh, seven days. I mean, usually after that you're using less mist. So you've got to be uh, aware of, uh, you know, how long your runs are and when that boom is going to get back, whether the cuttings dry out uh, between the swings. But uh, many growers are very successful using booms. Uh, they need a fine, um, a fine droplet, uh, not directed maybe directly down on the cutting. There's no point in, in causing abrasion. And um, just uh, let it go. It, it, it works well, especially, like I said, if the runs aren't too long. Um, and the important thing is run it a lot at the time you're sticking, and uh, certainly for the first 24 to 48 hours. It's really hard to apply too much water in, in that time period uh, if you're you know, sitting in, in temperatures that are typical summer greenhouse temperatures, uh, well into the 80s or 90s or, or even above. Uh, the water is, is good, it cools the leaves, and uh, basically uh, the plant senses a much cooler environment unless you let the cutting dry out. And then again, look at the leaves. If they're starting to roll, then uh, maybe you need something besides uh, a boom for, for mist if you're getting too much dry down uh, between passes. Okay, uh, thank you for that. It looks like we have a lot of questions about preventative fungicide applications and more in detail questions about fertility. Um, the next section we are going to talk about um, 
disease and insect management, and then Roger's going to talk with us about fertility. So we'll go ahead and move on uh, to the next section. Uh, here we're just going to go through propagation by week and just kind of let you know what you can expect from those cuttings on a weekly basis. And then also we'll just go, go into some cultural aspects of propagation, uh, physiological things that you can see, and talk about light levels and temperatures, etc. So this first picture here is obviously week one before the cutting is stuck. Um, so we'll move on to week two, and callus formation is going to, um, you know, should be initiating by day seven, and definitely by day 14 you should have that base of that cutting fully encompassed by the callus. And then once that callus formation is there, you should start to see those root initials pushing out. Um, you want to watch misting frequencies closely at this point because even though that callus formation is there, the callus doesn't absorb any water. And so it's still important to have that constant film of moisture on the leaves. And until those root initials start to put out, that cutting is relying on that film of moisture for its, that film of water for its um, moisture and it's not going to be absorbing anything through the roots. And at this point during week two, you know, once you're getting callus formation, it may be time to start thinking about um, growth regulating on some of your more vigorous varieties. And we'll go through some growth regulating recommended rates and methods of application in a little bit here. Uh, this is a picture of a cutting in week three. You can see that the roots have, uh, they should be fully expanded and, you know, pushing out into that oasis. Probably not, you know, just beginning to circle at this point. And the cuttings are, but it's important to remember that they're not ready for the stress of the greenhouse yet. And this really goes back to that gradual environmental changes. Um, you know, a grower might look at this and say, well, I've got roots there and they're nice and turgid and they're holding up. That means I can cut back on the mist, I can increase airflow, all those things. But, you know, you really do want to be careful with those those cuttings. And, you know, we do recommend that they go through a toning environment where the mist is uh, gradually reduced to a point that is completely shut off, light levels can gradually be increased, and your airflow can gradually be increased. But it is important that the cutting go through that process before it goes to the, you know, the stressful environment of the greenhouses. Um, depending on the environment, again, misting can stop during the, uh, may be able to stop during the day, but for sure at night, definitely by week three, you know, if, if you're having to, if you're finding that you're still having to mist in week three, there's obviously some environmental conditions that need to be adjusted. Again, as Roger said, we really don't like to see that mist go past the first week. And again, PGRs may be needed on some of your more vigorous varieties, so you may be looking at your second, second growth regulator application in the third week. And this is a picture of week four. This cutting's ready to go. You've got, you know, nice root, fine root hairs going there, um, nice circling. This cutting's been through the toning environment, and it's ready to be transplanted. I want to talk a little bit about environmental management and, that you know, that important point that we keep stressing about gradual changes. This uh, picture here is a picture of Peter Star Pink. Initially, when you look at this picture, a grower might think it's a nutritional problem. Um, you know, you're starting to get kind of that bleaching out of the chlorophyll, and it does, you know, on, on first glance, it could look nutritional. Um, what's actually happening to this cutting here is that there's been too rapid of a change in the environment, and particularly light levels. It's just too bright for that cutting. Um, not even too dry, it's just too bright, and you're starting to see some bleaching out of that. And so, um, you know, particularly in the propagation environment, um, nutrition might be our first inclination when you start to see changes in foliage color and things like that, but most of the time that's not the case. Um, you know, a lot of times it's an environmental issue and you're seeing those foliar uh, problems going on. This picture is an example of what heat damage would look like in transit. Um, certain varieties are more sensitive to excess temperatures in transit than others, um, and leaf yellowing can occur. And um, it's important to inspect those cuttings when they come in, and you know that's why we recommend sticking that temperature probe into the box and finding out what you know what that cutting's been through before it comes to your door. If you start to see leaf yellowing like this, leaf yellowing is not always a bad thing. And actually, um, you know, if you sit down and learn about the processes of leaf yellowing, the, cu the cutting's actually doing what it's supposed to do by moving those carbohydrates down to the base of the stem. But when you get leaf yellowing like this too fast those leaves can actually size, and, you know, then you've got that dead leaf matter sitting in the propagation area, and you're going to start to run into problems with fungus gnats and botrytis. And so leaf picking is a really important part of propagation. Um, you know, to a certain extent, it's normal to see a few yellow leaves here and there, and you really want to train your workers to be going through and remove, remove those leaves as they're sticking, uh, you know, but also go back and through and clean up any yellow leaves, you know, and be willing to touch those cuttings again to make sure you get those yellow leaves out of there. 
This is what heat damage looks like. Occasionally we can see cold damage, uh, depending on what you know temperatures and shipping are like. Cold damage would look different than heat damage um, in that you know a lot of times when cuttings arrive from heat damage they'll look perfectly normal and you'll start to see some yellowing leaves within about the first 48 hours. Cold damage should be apparent when the cuttings arrive and you know that would be kind of black tips on the leaves and black tips at the base of the stem. And this you know just leads me to an important point that when you get those cuttings and you're expect inspecting them if you feel at all uncomfortable about you know what those cuttings look like and you feel like there might be some issues please let customer service or technical support know so that we can help you through that process nine times out of ten you know the cuttings are going to be okay um, and we'll try to keep you on schedule with your propagation and not have to worry about you know replacement shipments and things like that but definitely if you're you know if you ever have questions right away let us know uh, this next picture here is an example of cuttings that are double spaced and this just we want to make this point that Stretch, um, you know, in the propagation environment can be um, pretty evident at times just because it's hot, it's humid, um, you know, there's low airflow, things like that. So it's all conducive to that stretch situation, and so it's tempting to double space those cuttings if you start to see stretch uh, rather than growth regulating. But at, oftentimes, you know, if you go to that double spacing situation, it's just too much airflow for those cuttings, and, you know, we'll start to see some leaf scarring. The cuttings will dry down way too fast. Um, you know, so while it's tempting, it's not always recommended. Uh, we want to talk about temperatures here and soil temperatures. Um, the digital thermometer that's shown in the picture here is a really good tool because you can use that to check your soil temps, but you can also stab that right into the boxes and check the temperature in the boxes. Um, but, it, you know, it, it is an important tool. You know, we'll stress later the importance of a light meter, but also a temperature probe. Uh, you know, two of your most important tools, I think, in the propagation environment. And uh, some growers are using infrared thermometers now, and they're also very common and also a good thing to have. It just says, as the slide says, don't guess. You know, just walking out in the greenhouse and kind of, you know, thinking that you might know what the light levels are or what the soil temperature is is not, you know, not always adequate. Especially if you're misting frequently, that's going to be cooling off the, you know, the temperature of the media. So good tool to have. Ideal light levels in propagation would be 12,000 or 1,200 to 1,500 foot candles. Uh, if they're less than that, less than 1,000, then it is going to result in a stretch and slow rooting situation. If they're more than 1,800 foot candles, it's going to require a situation where you are just misting too much and you can get foliage burn and bleaching. And then you'll also see that leaf scarring. So we really want to keep those light levels at 1,500 part, uh, foot candles if possible. And then, you know, with that excess mist, just remember that too much misting increases disease and leaches out the nutrients. So, you know, you might think that your light levels are too high, and so you're just going to compensate with more mist, and that's not always the best situation just because, you know, the excess mist leads to further problems. Uh, this is the light meter I mentioned. Um, it's just as important to it as an EC meter uh, or a pH meter might be in the finishing environment. Um, in propagation, you know, light levels and temperatures are really critical to get that cutting to root nicely and, and in the time that we want it to. And, you know, this could mean checking your light levels several times a day, especially, you know, with the changing weather patterns until you get a feel for if you've got the right amount of shade on. You know, it's a good, time, good, good thing to go out there and check your light levels several times a day. Another reminder about light management here, um, most greenhouses in almost all areas of the country during the summer months do need some shade, whether it's shade cloth or, you know, painted shade or whatever, however you're set up. So remember to shade those southeast and west walls. We'll talk a little bit about temperature management now. Um, we do want a good warm environment in the propagation environment. Uh, best callus formation is when the media is warm. So we like to see that media at 72 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in terms of ambient air temperatures, uh, we like to see the day temps between 76 and 82 and night temps at 70 to 74, which probably won't be a problem, you know, in June and July for most growers in the country. And oftentimes it can be too hot, especially during the day. If you can keep your night temperatures a little bit cool on the cooler side the first three days and also your day temperatures at the cooler end of this range, it will help reduce the incidence of Erwinia, which tends to be a little bit more exaggerated when temperatures are excessive. Um, you know, so again, night temps, you know, if we're recommending 70 to 74 those first three days, if you can try to keep it at 70 and keep your day temps at that 76 degrees to so the low end of the range, that'll help you get through that Erwinia problem, which really is only a, typically an issue for the first week. And then once you can get past that, you won't see it. 
temperatures outside these optimal ranges will slow brooding and reduce uniformity. And uh, you should run these temperatures through week three until you go to that toning environment, at which time the bottom heat can be shut off, and then you can also reduce your temperatures by five degrees. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about growth regulators now. Um, we, are, we do recommend a tank mix of B9 cycle cell in the, in the propagation environment, and typically two to three applications will be all that you'd need in week two and three. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to look in that first week and know, you know, what, what you should do for applications, and you're thinking maybe in week two that it's, you know, it doesn't look like you're going to need any, but by week three it might have been too late. And so always don't skip the first would be our recommendation. You know, the rates that we recommend are low enough and not residual enough that it's always better to err on the side of getting that first application in rather than skipping it. You know, and in that you'll start to notice, especially if, if the cuttings haven't been graded well in that first week, that those taller cuttings are going to take off and root faster. And once they root, they're going to put on vegetative growth faster, and then you just run into an uneven situation. So this first application is a real good way to kind of even up that growth and slow the rate of those that are growing a little bit too fast. And again, it's a tank mix of B9 cycle cell that we recommend. And the first spray, the first spray as we said, is most important for uniformity. And this, the pictures to the right just reiterate that, um, you know, skipping the first spray, that cutting on the right is an example where the first spray was skipped in both pictures. And you can see that you've got inner node stretch. The cutting looks pretty soft. And, you know, for the most part, it's just more stretch than the cutting to the left. So rates that we would recommend would be B9 at 1,200 to 2,500 parts per million plus Cyclocell at 750 to 1,500 parts per million. And of course, with all growth regulator application, rates are going to vary depending on conditions and varieties. You know, once you get to know those varieties and you know so you have some of those vigorous varieties, you can go to the high end of the rate. Um, you know, for some of the slower growing varieties that we're looking more just for toning into evening up growth, you'd want to go with the, the lower end of the rate. And also keep in mind that with a cycle cell, typically when you get your rates up there in the 1,500 part per million range, if environmental conditions are stressful, you can see some yellowing from that cycle cell. So watch your environmental conditions at the time of that application as well. And, you know, there's a lot of growth regulators out there available today. Some of the Paclobutrazol pot products, um, a lot of chemicals with a lot stronger activity than the B9 cycle cell. And this picture here is an example of what Sumagic can do to cuttings. You can see that... Um, the roots are, you've got kind of uh, fasciated growth there where there's just way too many roots. It's clubby, um, you know, and these will probably just sit there like that for a long time. This is three weeks after stick from a Sumagic application. So, um, you know, even in the establishing environment, that cutting's going to sit there for a while. So, you know, while it may be tempting to think about a growth regulator with more residual activity or, you know, applied as a drench kind of situation, it definitely, you know, you want to think about that and trial your rates if you're trying different things. This picture just shows here um, a nice uniform crop that's been treated with the two growth regulator applications. These were stuck on six, June 6th. The picture was taken 622, so uh, two weeks after. And then approximately a week and a half later, these cuttings were ready for ship. And you can see that you've got nice uniform growth. Um, you don't have cuttings that are stretching um, where others are not. This is an example of what two growth regulator applications on the cuttings would look like. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about physical damage. Um, you know, this is just an example here of what, you know, leaf scarring when the cuttings are handled to roughly when they're being stuck or, you know, when they're being moved around in propagation, et cetera. First, at a first glance, you know, a grower might be concerned about an insect problem or something, but this is just actual physical damage. And this next slide is a picture of environment and, you know, damage from a stressful environment. You can see that you've got leaf scarring, you've got leaf yellowing, marginal yellowing, marginal burn. Um, this is probably all a situation where there was too much air movement, too low of humidity, and too bright of light where you can see the damage like that. And, the, you know, when you transplant those cuttings, they'll be fine. And those, you know, those leaves, they're going to be covered up by the new growth. But, um, you know, it's definitely not something that we want to see coming out of propagation if you can at all help it. And this is just another slide that reiterates that gradual changes, please. You can see here on the left-hand side uh, within the yellow circles, that's actually kind of a strappy leaf that you would see uh, with heat stress. And, you know, you could see that on certain varieties are more susceptible to, than others. And if it's, you know, real 
uh, excessive temperatures in the propagation environment, some of those new leaves coming out after transplant can look kind of strappy like that. And you can also see there's some leaf scarring going on. Um, whether that's from too much airflow, too low a humidity or bright light, it could be a combination of a lot of things. And the picture on the right side, you know, shows where the shade cloth just isn't extending all the way to the bench and those cuttings there on the end are really going to suffer from too much bright light. We want to talk a little bit about fungus gnats. Um, as we all know, fungus gnats are not, the adults are not detrimental to the crop, but if you get a high enough larval population, they will start to feed on those cuttings. And once they start to feed on cuttings, you won't get any rooting, and you can also open those plants up to a disease situation. Moisture management is key in preventing fungus gnats. Again, with that constant film of moisture, the, the goal is to keep that leaf wet without oversaturating the media, which can, you know, create a fungus gnat situation. It is a good idea, especially if you've had problems with fungus gnats before to implement a rotation and some chemicals that we found effective would include DuraGuard, Safari, or Distance. Um, you know, you can, depending on the population levels and how, you know, what your insect pressure is like, you may need a weekly application um, or it may just mean, you know, one right away when the cuttings are stuck and that'll get you through depending on your moisture management, things like that. Um, Foliar diseases can also be a problem in propagation to the uh, Erwinia is a soft rotting bacteria and again that's going to be a problem in your first five days if you have excessive temperatures. So temperature management is also um, a good way to try to ward off Erwinia. And then the other major problem would be botrytis and of course um, leaf picking just with the high moisture availability and those botrytis spores being ever present in the environment. Um, you know, it, it isn't uncommon to see a little botrytis here and there, and so we do recommend weekly fungicide applications uh, with things like Decree, Chipco, or Dacanil. I do want to point out that there are a good number of chemicals available that are labeled for botrytis and Erwinia and, you know, Rhizoctonia and all of those things that can affect a poinsettia crop. If you have questions about chemicals, you know, and what you could use and suggested rates and recommendations, you can visit ecchi.com, and we do have our pest management charts there for you to take a look at. Um, and on that note, I would just stress that it's always, you always want to consult the label. Uh, there's a lot of literature available about different chemicals, but at the end of the day, you always want to consult the label before you use that product in the greenhouse. Okay, we've got some time for questions. Um, I'm gonna All right, well, you take a look and review those. I had a, a few points here. I had three points I wanted to cover, Rebecca. Uh, one with Erwinia. Uh, don't water in the media too far in advance. If you wet it 24, 48 hours ahead of time and let it sit on the bench and heat up, there's a, just a greater chance that Erwinia, which is always present, uh, could be a bigger problem. So we suggest uh, within a few hours of sticking to do those irrigations uh, to wet the media. Uh, if you have any leaves to remove, if they don't just fall off and abscise off the main stem, then just take your fingernail and just break it off at the petiole and leave a little piece of the petiole behind. There's just too much chance if you strip that leaf of having damage at the main stem where you'll get botrytis. And uh, probably many of you are thinking, well, 1,500 foot candles isn't very bright. I can propagate higher light levels. But realistically, um, you're growing many varieties in these programs often novelties along with uh, light varieties and dark green leaf varieties. So it's a good idea if you can um, to just consider that you need one shade level for the entire crop. And so that's why we recommend the 1500 foot candles, although some of the dark leaf varieties will tolerate a higher light level than that. Also, if you have a retractable system, you may be able to increase light levels once the cuttings are rooted. Uh, and that's fine, but do it gradually and watch the weather conditions. Okay? Okay. Um, let's see. I have a question here about um, stock plant cuttings. And if we do have some growers joining us in the audience today that grow their own stock, and we're wondering if they, what our recommendations for, uh, would be in terms of actually taking that cutting. Do we, recommend, do we recommend snapping, breaking, or using a sharp knife for those stock plant cuttings? A sharp knife. You want a clean cut. You don't want jagged ends. Jagged ends could get Erwinia infection very easily. So keep your knives clean and just get a good, a good clean cut. Okay. 
Thank you. We do have a question here about bonsai um, and recommended rates and propagation. Um, I guess I would just point out that bonsai is not typically something that we use in our own propagation because we have found that it, it is not necessary. Um, bonsai is a lot more residual. Uh, act, has a lot more residual activity than something like B9 Psychocell. Um, but there are growers that are using bonsai today, and uh, my suggestion would be that if you'd like to try to use bonsai, you know, definitely consult the label uh, for the recommended rates. And then, you know, there are tech support people available uh, that make bonsai as well that could answer those questions. Uh, but at the end of the day, trialing is the most important thing. Um, if you're just not sure, don't go out and apply it to the entire crop. Uh, without, without knowing what those rates can do because, you know, with those more stronger acting chemicals, it can take a long time for that cutting to grow out of it. It can slow up rooting, you know, and it can really have a negative impact even in the finishing environment. Uh, but, you know, for sure consult the label for recommended rates. It's also hard, especially in liner production, to do uniform coverage because bonsai is absorbed through the stems, maybe the media if you get runoff, and with those plants all crowded together, maybe some plants will receive more application than others. Whereas um, if you spray overhead and you get uh, B9 psychocell on the leaves, it will be absorbed through the leaf. So it's easier to apply and more forgiving. That's a good point. Also with bonsai, you know, if you have variable moisture content within those cells, you're going to get variable activity with that chemical um, and any of those products that are taken up through the stem. If, you know, if some cells are drier than others, you're just going to get a lot of different activity. And so, you know, spray is obviously more uniform. Okay, it looks like we've answered all the questions there. With that, we're going to turn it back over to Roger and he's going to talk with us about fertility. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, in 98, we did some work uh, in Encinitas just tracking fertility level in the leaves by taking weekly samples and propagation. And we could see, you know, from the chart here, some of these older varieties that we had then uh, looking at light leaf and dark leaf varieties, uh, some of the leaching impact uh, over time of the different nutrients. Let's go to the next slide. You can see it visually, I think, pretty clearly. At the time of plant, you've got a high level of potassium. It drops to about half that level after just a week uh, or 10 days in propagation. It's important uh, as we talk about fertility to get fertilizer into the cuttings at about a week to 10 days so that uh, with the media fed as the roots develop, you're beginning to rebuild those nutrient levels. So as you look over here to the right, you see that the last bar shows that the level's beginning to recover, and that's because we fed around April 9th on that slide. Take a look at the next slide, Rebecca. And you see the same kind of response with nitrogen. And we really saw this with all the elements uh, that we were um, monitoring. Uh, go back one. OK. Um, yeah, here on the last two, you can see that we've begun an upward movement. It's really important to get that upward movement and rebuild the nutrients in the cuttings because uh, shortly after propagation, uh, you're going to transplant, you're going to pinch. You want to have good nutritional levels in the cuttings at the time of pinch to get good branching and good growth. So again, uh, very important to get that feed on, not only for the future growth and branching, but also that feed's important for getting good rooting. If you don't feed and you leach all these nutrients out, you'll get more uneven rooting and poor performance of the cuttings. Okay. Next slide. And here's just some general fertilizer recommendations. Again, feed at 7 to 10 days. Doesn't have to be a strong feed. 150 parts is fine. Um, then weekly thereafter, uh, a product like a 21520 is good. 18318. There's many of them available, but it's important to have low ammonium and keep the phosphorus levels down, maybe no more than about 10% uh, phosphorus in the feed. Uh, what happens is at 10% or higher, uh, unless you carefully rinse the foliage, you could get a buildup of the phosphorus and get that distortion I talked about earlier and uh, uh, get some strapped leaves and some other uh, conditions uh, from the phosphorus uh, residue. Okay. And please don't feed and mist. Uh, we see time and time again uh, growers running into trouble uh, because the rates vary, because there's deposits of phosphorus or other elements that cause distortion, um, hardening of the cutting, sometimes abortion of the tip even. 
So um, just plain water works really, really well. Also, with feed in the mist, you can end up with a lot more algae. That can lead to more fungus gnats. And it just is very difficult to manage. Maybe if you've got a stock program going on nearby and that feed uh, cross feeds into the mist because someone leaves a valve open, again, we've seen that. Uh, it's better to have plain water go through that mist line. OK, next slide. It's very hard to judge nutrient levels in poinsettias. Um, just by color of the leaf, highlight levels will be tend to be dark, uh, lighter, bleached sort of appearance. And uh, also, there's varietal differences. So um, if you want to know your nutrient levels in the tissue, have them measured by a lab. And that's just the best way to tell. After that, when you develop a program, you have confidence in it, you'll have your nutritional levels uh, adequately uh, planned and uh, consistent year after year. OK. All right, any questions? Yep, we do have a question. Um, if we're not recommending applying the fertilizer through the mist, what's the preferred method of application then for the fertilizer? The preferred application method, well, if you've got a boom, you could apply it by a boom. Uh, you could go in and do it with a hose, like a sprench. Uh, we have a trough system. You can see in some of the photos today uh, where we do sub-irrigation. That works, too. Uh, if you go in overhead, uh, it is a good idea, if you can, to just rinse the foliage uh, before it dries completely, especially in those later weeks when you're not running uh, the plain mist and just uh, wash those fertilizer residues off just so you don't get any problem with toxicity. OK. I'm just going back through here questions to make sure that we've answered all of the questions that have been, uh, that we've addressed everything that's come over today. And it looks like we have. Um, I just would mention again, you know, if you have further questions once you, um, you know, have viewed the recorded version or, you know, you think of questions, you can always contact tech support at the Ecke Ranch. Or you can post your questions on, on board, our live interactive bulletin board. That's a great way to get uh, live information. And that's a good segue to my next slide, actually. Uh, these are the different uh, avenues of tech support that are available at the Ecke Ranch. Uh, if you go to www.ecke.com, uh, one of the pages that you'll find is production guidelines. On the production guidelines page, um, we do have over 75 documents on various aspects of prop uh, production. There is a propagation tech sheet. There's, um, you know, sheets that talk about pinching. There's, you know, different production schedules. There's just a lot of good information there. Um, white flies, disease management. Um, you know, so if you haven't checked that out, that's a good resource. And then we also have the crop information page, and that's where you'll find detailed information about every variety that we offer. Uh, you'll find response times, flower initiation dates, um, you know, recommended container sizes, uh, schedules, uh, samples of scheduling. And so the crop information is where you'll go, you know, if you've got a new variety in your production this year and you need more information about it. And then as Roger and I both mentioned, if you have questions, on board is a great resource. It is live and it's interactive. Uh, we do try strive to answer questions within 24 business hours. Uh, but during poinsettia season, I'm happy to say that we usually answer those questions a lot faster than that and respect that, you know, when you guys have questions, you need answers quickly. And this is a good time also to point out on Target. On Target is our free web-based height tracking program. Um, it is available. It's not a program that you have to download. It is web-based. And the advantage to it being web-based is that, you know, if you have questions about your crop and, you know, want some growth regulator recommendations, with your permission, I can log on to your account at the same time and look at your graphs with you and, you know, we can make some height decisions together. We also have some upgrades that we've made this year and you'll be able to record full cultural notes this year, uh, things like pH and EC, uh, fertility rates, um, you know, everything that you need to record about that crop, you can keep it on target. And then you can also upload photos. Um, and so it's a great place to store your information. We do keep it from year to year on our server, but you can also download everything to Excel. Okay, with that, um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And again, just mention that this is the first of our three-part Back to Basics series. Look for email invitations to follow for the session that we'll have at the end of July. And then again, the finishing section in the 1st of September. Uh, before we say goodbye today, Roger, did you have any additional comments? Yeah, just one. For those of us who still read books uh, and don't necessarily go online for all our information, the Ecke Poinsettia Manual 
has a terrific chapter on poinsettia propagation with lots of photos and some additional information. Highly recommended reading. All right. Thank you, Roger. And again, this session is recorded today. Um, it'll be available about 24 hours, 24 hours after the session to view on, on media. Um, you know, so you can go back and take a look if you've got staff that missed the session and you'd like them to sit in. Um, you just have to have Windows Media Player to take a look. Um, I'd like to thank you today on behalf of the entire staff of the Ecke Ranch. We're pleased to have you with us today and hope that you found the information useful. And we look forward to uh, having you join us the next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good luck. Okay, bye-bye.